Okay, welcome everybody. I am Julie Wiskirken from the Toxic Google team here at Google LA. And uh, today is Take Your Dogs to Work Day, and we see a lot of dogs here in the crowd, which is great. Um, and we are excited to welcome Seth Castile. Uh, just a little background on Seth. In 2007, he began volunteering to photograph homeless pets to help them find loving families. And since then, has developed a career as a lifestyle pet photographer, accepting commissions and commercial assignments, collaborating with dozens of publishers, and exhibiting his artwork in galleries around the world. His work has been published in National Geographic magazine, The New York Times, and in hundreds of other magazines, newspapers, and calendars. His nonprofit campaign, One Picture Saves a Life, inspires, empowers, and educates animal ambassadors around the world to improve the image of rescue and adoption through positive photography. His book, Underwater Dogs, was the best-selling photography book of 2012. And today, he's going to talk about his new book, which is called Underwater Puppies. So please join me in welcoming Seth Castile. Thank you. It's good to be here. I actually live down the street. I've never had an opportunity to come here to the, the campus, so kind of exciting. Uh, I was also up in the Mountain View area yesterday, riding around on a Google bike. So I've had two days of Google. Pretty, pretty cool. Um, so my name's Seth. My last name's Castile. I am an author, um, sort of. I always tell people I'm an author, and they're like, what, what are you writing about? Nothing. <laughs> uh, so I'm technically an author, but also a photographer. But more than anything else, I just love dogs and then cats uh, and lots of other animals, too. So that's just kind of my thing. Uh, a little fun fact about me, I don't really even love photography that much. Uh, I'm not like the crazy photography guy. A lot of people think that I would be. Um, years ago, I think I just got really excited about learning about photography and the cameras and the lenses, and I used to bring my gear everywhere, travel around the country, around the world, I'd take pictures of everything, my friends, myself, uh, you know, landscapes, anything I could just take a picture of, I would. And then I think I just realized I was missing out on the moment, um, you know, which I should be enjoying. So it was really, it was about the picture, and I just kind of missed out on a lot of moments there. So I stopped taking pictures. Really, I don't take pictures of anything unless it's something that I'm really passionate about, uh, like this project here. Um, I have hundreds of thousands of pictures sitting on hard drives from years ago, some of which might be pretty cool. I haven't even looked at them. I haven't even looked at them. You know, in terms of my career, I might be a photographer for another few years. I might, I might not. I have no idea. I just like to use photography to kind of tell my story and tell the story uh, of my subject matter. And that's why, I, that's why I use photography, because it kind of works out for me. Uh, before we get into this, first of all, how many dog people out there? <laughs> that's surprising. OK, how many cat people out there? All righty. <laughs> I like cats, too. But I'm more of a dog guy. Actually, I'm working on the new book right now, Underwater Cats. <laughs> if, you go to, if you go to the website, underwatercats.com, which I own, you'll find approximately zero pictures. <laughs> That, that book uh, is on hold indefinitely. Um, but in case the world turns upside down and dogs become cats and cats become dogs, I will be ready for that moment. Speaking of cats, uh, this is kind of how I got started. And I'd like to speak with you, to you guys for maybe about 30 minutes-ish. Uh, if people were disappearing or throwing tomatoes at me, I'll try to cut it off sooner. But uh, you give me a microphone and you give me some, a huge screen like this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ramble on. So also, at any point during this, if anybody has any questions, feel free to just raise your hand, run over to the microphone, and, and ask me, and I'll do my best to answer you. So this is how it all started for me. I'm originally from the state of Illinois. I moved out to California in uh, 1999, went to Chapman University down in Orange County, studied film production, thought I was going to be a movie director, a movie producer, a movie writer. Got a job at Sony Pictures right out of college as an assistant, uh, and then moved into finance and actually had quite a bit of responsibility in finance, having no experience in finance. And people were wondering why Sony wasn't doing so well for a while. Uh, but made the transition over to motion pictures, where I was working on advertising campaigns, uh, movie posters, trailers, TV spots, for all of Columbia Pictures movies, uh, James Bond, Spider-Man, Angels and Demons, Da Vinci Code, that kind of thing. Pretty cool. And that's where I met these little cats, these baby cats. Uh, I had a friend of mine, wonderful lady, all about animal welfare, all about helping cats. She's the kind of person who can't say no. You ask her if, if she can help. Hey, I found a cat. Hey, can you just watch my cat for a while? Can you take this litter of kittens? It's always a yes. So I think maybe her heart sometimes is a little bigger than the logic of her mind. 
Uh, for that, you can applaud her, but it also can get someone in trouble. When I first met her, she was also working at Sony with me. She had five cats, and then within uh, a period of time, she had about 60 cats. And I said, I said, you know, I don't know. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to mention her name here, just in case, but uh, sweet lady. But she, I said, I don't know a lot about cats, but I feel like that's at least five too many cats. <laughs> so anyways, we found these kittens on the Sony Pictures Studio lot. Basically what was going on, there was a bunch of cats living on the lot. There was a feral cat colony. And then my friend and some other people there at Sony would take care of the feral cats, make sure they're well fed, their health is all right. Uh, any new additions, they would trap, spay or neuter, and release them back into the studio wild. The cats had it pretty good there in the lot, though. I mean, things were, things were going well, hanging out with movie stars, uh, unlimited food options, and they called all their friends. I mean, they just got on the phone. They called everybody. So cats were just coming in to Sony, left and right. What happens when that happens? Baby cats. So they found these guys, and my friend was like, oh, no, Seth, you know, <laughs> more, ca more cats, the babies. You know, I have to keep them. You know, what are we going to do? So I just got a Rebel XT from Canon and a Sigma 24 to 70 lens, was experimenting with photography a little bit. So I said, hey, let's take some pictures of these little clowns and use the Sony email network, blast out the shots, and see if we can get some attention right away. Because uh, I just knew that you know, the kittens needed help, and my friend was way in over her head. So that's what we did. We stuck him into an executive's office, actually John Callie's office at the time. He was out for lunch, and uh, the kittens were just climbing around on the furniture, didn't know much about photography, didn't know a lot about cats, uh, just did these snapshots. I like the claw here on the couch, it's my favorite. So did these shots, used the Sony uh, network, which you're not supposed to use the Sony network for that. But I was saying, what is Sony gonna do, fire us for trying to help homeless kittens? It's a great PR line. Sony fires employees for helping homeless kittens. <laughs> so anyways, blast out the shots, all the kittens got adopted in about 24 hours, which is pretty cool. Uh, here's another little fun shot. Two weeks later, we found some more kittens, did the same thing again, the power of the photograph, power of the internet, um, just really kind of an exciting thing, and it's just a volunteer deal. So I started volunteering at the West LA Animal Shelter, taking pictures of dogs and cats to help increase adoptions. I just wandered in there and said, you guys need a hand? They said, sure. So that's what I did. I'll do a little slideshow here of before and after pictures. You guys kind of get a sense of what I was up to, and this is how it all started for me. First with cats. Uh, these are typical intake shots you might find at an animal shelter as of several years ago. Still today, if you hop onto a public animal shelter website, you might see a lot of very negative images. Uh, I am not a fan of that. Anybody out there have, has seen the commercials on TV with the sad music, Sarah McLaughlin? Uh, and so a lot of, raise your hand if you've seen the commercials. How many people change the channel when you see that? Okay, quite a few. Um, so it's, I love the ASPCA, terrific organization, they're friends of mine but I have to challenge their campaign. So when you see those commercials, it's a fundraising campaign and not an adoption campaign. The money is a big part of it. It does take money to run such an extensive operation, but I have to ask the ASPCA at what cost? You know, um, what kind of damage are you doing to people out there? You know, the perception of the animal shelter is so important and you're really, you're not doing any favors for traffic to the animal shelter because people see Images like this are the videos on TV, and they don't want to go down there. You know, they don't want to go down there, they don't want to bring their kids down there, and it's tough. So we do this instead. I think it's just more uplifting. It shows people that the animals are great. They can be your best friend. Uh, they're not broken. You know, they're not dangerous. They're just terrific, and they just need a little help from us. That's all it is. So we're doing these kind of shots. So I was traveling around. Uh, here's Olive. And these are, you know, when these dogs and cats come into the animal shelter, they're coming in from a variety of circumstances, most of which probably aren't very positive. They have no idea what's going on. They're not looking their best or feeling the best at all. And it's not the ideal time to take their glamour shot, basically, that's going to get them a new home. Uh, unfortunately, that's what happens. These are called ID shots. So dogs and cats enter the shelter. Um, basically, they get all the information down. They take an ID shot or an intake shot, mostly just to keep track of who's who. But an image like this will go up on the internet and other places, and this is the only thing that's going to maybe draw attention to Olive here. So not exactly doing Olive any favors. You do this instead. And what we're finding is people are actually printing out these better images and bringing them in, and they're having a reaction that's really positive. And they weren't afraid to come in anymore. When they see these pictures, it's like we're using, try to use elements of nature, uh, better lighting, personality of the, the dogs and the cats, and we just saw a huge difference. Chubs. 
<laughs> He's a funny little guy, huh? <laughs> I like the bandana, but out of everything else, this is probably the middle of the night, sometime in September 2011. Uh, ominous boots, legs. I mean, this is not doing this dog any favors at all. Uh, do this instead. This is in Chicago. So basically, I started volunteering at West LA, South LA. Then I was traveling around to different animal shelters uh, all around the country, just volunteering. And then I started teaching workshops on my own, also to people who are interested in how to take better adoption photos. Uh, also traveled to Europe, did a bunch of workshops in Europe and Australia, which was pretty cool. But through the course of doing all that, I learned a lot about the marketing of rescue and adoption and how the image of it is so important that it needs to be more positive. A little min pen guy, it's kind of funny. <laughs> Bailey, I mean, you wouldn't even know what this dog looks like. Also in Chicago, when I started volunteering in Chicago, um, it's Chicago's the third largest city by population in the United States. Uh, they have one of the largest animal shelters also in the United States with 25,000 pets intake per year. Uh, at the time when I came in, they had really nobody taking pictures at all other than the intake shots. Uh, the shelter is in a bad part of town. It's more on the south side of Chicago. Not a lot of people even know about it. And, and I'm thinking, how, there's really nobody volunteering there at all. I'm thinking, how could this be? Chicago's a good city. I'm originally from Illinois. Good city, good hearted people, animal lovers. What's the disconnect? People just didn't know about the shelter. Or if they did, they were just so terrified that they, didn't, they just didn't think they could go in there. So fortunately today, things are improving with Chicago and many animal shelters and that people are learning that it's not a bad place. Uh, also in Chicago, Wilma. And this is really a standard. Chicago Animal Care and Control photo as of a few years ago. This is, this is going to be the ticket. Uh, so we were doing that. And these are, I did all these probably 60 seconds for Wilma, meet the next dog, take a couple of minutes. Um, here's Blake. Couldn't really see what Blake looks like right here. And you have that. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. Uh, now there's a little smoke and mirrors going on because sometimes I'll offer the dog a treat if they're allowed to have a treat and they're behaving a little bit. And so as they're chewing treats, yeah, you want a treat, don't you? Uh, as, they're, as, they're <laughs> as they're chewing treats, I'll take pictures. It also works good for people. If you give your friend a treat, you take pictures of them, get some funny shots. So now we'll get to this guy. So while I was volunteering, um, somebody asked me, hey, can I hire you to photograph my dog? It's actually a Mastiff, and this is back in 2007. I said, sure. So I started a part-time gig as a lifestyle pet photographer back in 2007 and just continued to do that you know, as I basically received commission. So I was volunteering, had a part-time gig, was working at Sony, uh, got recruited, went over to Disney for a while, had a quick six months over there, came in, worked pretty hard, ended up getting fired, um, mostly for embezzling. No, just kidding. <laughs> Just kind of wrong place at the wrong time. Always loved Disney Studios, big fan of the movies growing up. Still a big fan of Disney, um, but I wasn't drinking enough Kool-Aid, and I think I just kind of walked into a, a situation where I really just couldn't figure it out. But I was putting in about 100 hours a week. Um, came in one day and they said, you know, you're out, and didn't really give me any good reasons why. Uh, but didn't cry about it. I said, uh, maybe I cried for a second. <laughs> uh, said, you know what? No hard feelings, didn't burn any bridges, and I've actually been hired back on by Disney to work on some projects since then, which is kind of cool. But I decided I'm at a crossroads. Do I stay in advertising or do I pursue my photography full time? I decided on the latter, and uh, things weren't going that well at first because I just didn't have enough business to pay for the rent, pay for the car insurance, pay for the health insurance, pay for a hot date every now and again. Uh, so I wasn't able to go on too many hot dates for a while, but. Um, a company called Groupon approached me. Everybody familiar with Groupon? Groupon approached me about doing a deal together, and I was so flattered, and then it occurred to me, Groupon was pretty much approaching everybody to do a deal. <laughs> I took the bait. For $59, you could hire me. I would come out to photograph your pet, or you and your pet, uh, at your home or a location of your choosing. Uh, and there was supposed to be a 10-mile radius of my home, which was here in the West LA area. Uh, it turned out to be about a 150-mile radius. Because people were booking me in you know, Orange County, and Riverside, San Diego, Santa Barbara. So out of the $59, I made a whopping $29 per photo shoot. Split it down the middle. I thought I was pretty good on negotiating that deal. <laughs> As it turned out, it wasn't such a good deal. When you factor in all the driving, uh, the fuel costs, and then you, you factor in my time, I mean, I was losing, losing quite a bit of money. First, I was like, wait, how I'm not making any money. How much am I actually losing? 
So, <laughs> but we did book about 30 Groupon shoots. I did most of those. Um, lost quite a bit of money doing that. And I was already uh, in debt. I think I had about maybe $45,000, $50,000 in debt at the time. Things weren't looking that optimistic in terms of having, uh, having a career. Hey, guys, keep it down back there. Who would have thought? Dogs barking. <laughs> but here's my little knight in shining armor right here, Buster the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. Show up at this Groupon photo shoot. All right, settle, settle. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm very patient when it comes to dogs. So. <laughs> uh, so this is a Groupon photo shoot. I show up at Buster's house in Orange County, California. Show up, supposed to be an on land shoot. Buster obviously had other ideas. I did an interview with NBC Nightly News a couple weeks ago uh, with Brian Williams, and they asked me if I had any original shots of Buster from back in 2010. And I'm like, surely I do. So I went through the old hard drive, and I found some of these, and it just made me laugh, because I haven't seen these since 2010. Uh, but this is the very first photo shoot, and that's the first time I met Buster. He's obviously already wet here. He's already been in. And the background is uh, Buster's human named Jane, and Jane is saying, you better not do that. And Buster's saying, you know I'm going in there. So basically, he just kept jumping in. I like he's looking straight at the camera, too. It's kind of funny. Um, so she was kind of upset about it because she wanted some nice dry land shots. I thought it was hysterical, and I just loved to see how much he loved the water. So I left, bought the little point-and-shoot underwater camera by Sony, came back, did a couple experimental shots like this. Didn't even know if I was taking pictures or not. It was kind of confusing, um, but I was just pressing the button and see what happens. So then you have, here he is coming in a little bit, and then you have that. <laughs> and that's the original underwater dog shot that I took in 2010. I got home, I saw that, I said, holy smokes. What is going on here? So, of course, I was so excited, I sent it to Jane. Oh my God, Jane, you know, you're gonna love this. This is just unbelievable. Um, she's like, yeah, yeah, that's fine, but you know, you didn't get the dry shots, so. <laughs> I went back down, I did some, I went, drove back down there, did some dry shots of Buster, and she was very happy about that. Um, and then I just got more curious about dogs in the water, what's going on, what's going on with the connection. So I kept driving down there more times just to see this little guy, did some more shots of him, tried different types of camera gear, underwater camera bags, different types of housings, you name it, I pretty much tried it. Um, experimenting with lighting, and really just trying to understand what was going on with this. Uh, here's this, which is now actually a, a giant tattoo on my arm. This is one of my favorite shots. <laughs> People are like, wait a minute, you have a tattoo of somebody else's dog on your arm? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but it's only my, almost my entire arm, you know? <laughs> it's not my entire back. <laughs> but actually, I took this with an underwater camera bag, and you, you, know, you put your camera in there, and you kind of seal it up, and you're just thinking, is this going to work? <laughs> But we ended up with this shot. I didn't even know about this until about a year later. I, take, I was taking so many photos, I didn't know what to look for. And I went back through my images, and I ended up, and I found this shot. Now it's become one of my favorite pictures, which is why I put it on my arm. But uh, this little dog surely changed my life the moment he jumped in the pool. And if I could buy him a beer, I would. But he has unlimited treats on me for the rest of eternity. Here we are underwater together. <laughs> I don't know who ended up getting the tennis ball here. It looks like it's going to be a close call. Uh, here we are. I think he looks very noble here, but a couple of, you can see the tattoo in his little face, but I still get to see him from time to time. Um, he lives down in Orange County, and it's just, whenever I see him, it's just so much fun. So got curious after Buster, who else likes the water? Started photographing some other dogs just around the LA area. I bought a surf housing by a company called SPL Water Housings, and they basically, they're a shop out of San Diego. They make a case for your camera, mostly for surfers, waves, surfing, bodyboarding, that kind of thing. Uh, for me, it was a more affordable option than a full scuba housing, so I bought that for a few thousand dollars using the last available credit I had on my credit card, so that was kind of the end. Uh, couldn't afford rent at the time, and it's obviously, it's a clear choice. You know, when you don't have any money left and you have 50 or $55,000 in debt, you have to go buy an underwater camera housing immediately. <laughs> so that's what I did. A lot of my friends thought I was taking crazy pills. Um, maybe I was, but I just, they kept telling me, you got to do weddings. I'm like, weddings? I'm not doing weddings, unless the two golden retrievers get married. <laughs> so I made these pictures for fun. 
um, all around the country. This ended up in National Geographic magazine, Visions of Earth, in August 2012. That's kind of a fun thing for me. It's always a dream, you know, to be a part of National Geographic in the actual magazine, and it was the opening shot for the vision section. Uh, so about 40 million people saw that shot. Pretty cool. Just from National Geographic alone. Uh, this is a picture that ended up changing my life in terms of how the pictures became popular. So I made the series for fun, um, you know, with that camera housing, put them on my website. February 9, 2012, this image becomes popular on Reddit and Google+. Thanks, Google. <laughs> Started making the rounds, and then it went on other social media outlets. Uh, you name it, it was on there. In the course of 24 hours, it's estimated that around 100 million people saw the shots. Uh, that's quite a few people, I guess. Didn't really, know, <laughs> didn't really know what that all meant. It was just a frenzy. My website crashed. I had a, a deal with GoDaddy, but I was on a shared server, limited bandwidth, so we could only track however many you know, we had, I think, 175,000 to 200,000 hits a day, and that was like, that's all we could really get. So we don't really know. But I like to think people try to get on my website, they couldn't get on. So what you can't have, you want more. Uh, so I think people maybe got more curious about it. Woke up to phone calls from the media and everybody else asking about the pictures, and my life has never been the same since then. On the phone with uh, CNN World Report with Anna Corrin on the other line, Good Morning America, and trying to figure out who is more important. Uh, good problem to have, but as somebody who is a struggling photographer and who had zero dollars left, I'm like, I got to seize the moment, you know? I got to seize the moment. This is an opportunity here, I think. Seize the moment. So we did. I did every interview I could. I just worked my tail off and um, made a book called Underwater Dogs. Got a book deal with a company called Little Brown and Company. Uh, chose an agent first. Didn't know how anything worked with book publishing. Had no idea about the process, didn't even know all the major players in the world of publishing, but I uh, selected a lady named Michelle Tesler out of New York to be my agent. She liked dogs, I liked dogs, seemed like a pretty good fit. We made a book proposal, the book went to auction, um, and every major publisher bid on the rights to sell the book, which was kind of crazy, and we ended up choosing uh, Little Brown and turning down Random House. Again, kind of a good problem to have. Uh, but all this was happening so fast, I just didn't even realize, you know, I thought we were going to get an advance of like $500 to make the book. Uh, and I'm like, wow. And then we got, we got a little more than that. So we threw a party in Las Vegas. <laughs> that was kind of fun. <laughs> uh, the book came out in October of 2012 with a very limited print run. I was a first time author, even though Little Brown was very enthusiastic about the book. They didn't print very many copies. I didn't know that. Um, so basically, the book came out. It was one of uh, Oprah's favorite books of the year. We had a ton of media around the book, of course, and um, you couldn't buy it really anywhere. So I know, I was like, I couldn't buy my own book for three weeks. Anywhere, couldn't buy it, couldn't buy it, it was sold out everywhere. I mean, I guess that's a good problem to have, but you know, we, were trying to, we were trying to sell books. So if you're trying to sell books, I guess you kind of have to have books. Regardless, it was still a New York Times bestseller for 11 weeks on the hardcover nonfiction list. It even beat out Bill O'Reilly. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> Uh, it was the best-selling photography book of the year and one of the best-selling photography books in history with over a half a million copies in print, 13 editions around the world, and it's just dogs jumping into swimming pools. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the craziest thing. So anyways, a lot of fun. Uh, some of the adults thought the images were too, maybe too fierce, too primal, too many teeth, but all the kids that I was talking to just thought they were hilarious. So anyways, we made a kid's book for adults. So you can pick that up if you're an adult. If you're a kid, you probably don't like it. But if you're an adult, you might really like it. And you get a free poster. Uh, so this came out about a year ago. And it's done well. Scholastic picked up a lot of copies for all the book fairs around at the schools. I remember growing up as a kid, you know, you have the book fair. And it was so exciting to go to the book fair. And you get to pick out your book or a couple books. So that's been fun that this, is, uh, this has been in all the book fairs. And I wrote this. Actually, I did do a little writing here. There's some like, fun rhymes going on in the pages if you flip through this book. And the publisher is like, oh, we'll hire somebody to do that. And I'm like, what, I can't do it? So I wrote it. I think it's kind of fun. I don't know if it's good, but it works. We also made some board books for kids. Some kids were ripping the pages out. They didn't like the uh, kids' book because there was no uh, teethy images, so they were ripping the pages out. They were so upset. So we made two board books, colors and numbers. I recommend, if you're learning to count to 10, the book on the right. It's a good one for you.
So that was kind of cool to have those. Uh, and then, of course, the next project. What do you do? I've worked with dogs. It's been great. We made the kids' books. Obviously, the cat thing. Uh, bought underwater cats. Explored that for a second. Shut the window on that one. Um, <laughs> although I have been swimming with quite a few cats, surprisingly. So most cat breeds, as we know, do not have a history with the water or an appreciation for the water. It just doesn't exist. With some exceptions, Turkish Vans and Maine Coons, as well as Bengals and some exotic mixes, do have history with the water and actually get in and swim. Pretty cool. And then you talk about exotic cats, wild cats. You know, you have tigers, you have fishing cats in Southeast Asia, even bobcats. You have that kind of stuff. That's definitely possible. I've been in the pool with tigers. I've been in the pool with bobcats. Um, pretty interesting stuff, but could you really make a whole book out of it? Eh, you know, questionable. So we put that on hold. Puppies. So I'm like, well, I don't know, can I make a whole book about puppies? So we have two puppies in Underwater Dogs, the original book. One is 12 weeks, one is six months. And I'm thinking, well, these guys were into it, you know, maybe we can do a book. So started meeting up with some puppies at the pool and figured out that not only could I make it, but it really needed to be made for two reasons. Number one, water safety for pets. This is the big message about this project right here. People don't realize uh, that it's a huge problem here in the United States, especially swimming pools are on the rise. Global warming's happening. It's getting hotter and hotter. Swimming pools are going up, especially states like California, Arizona, Texas, and Florida. It's ridiculous. Between, and this is a really sour stat, but I'll tell you because most people don't think about this. Between seven and 10,000 dogs drown in swimming pools every year in the United States. That's a lot of dogs, and I feel like that shouldn't be that. That shouldn't be, it shouldn't be one dog drowning, you know? Um, and it's mostly because the dogs don't know how to get out of the swimming pool. That's it. You know, it's not because the people hate their dogs. It's not because the people are trying to set up their dog for disaster. Uh, they just don't think about it, you know? And I ask people, would you let your 18-month-old human child stay outside in your backyard with your pool unattended while you're off to work for eight hours? And they're like, no. But a lot of people let their dogs do that or have access to the backyard where their pool is during the day and thinking, oh, they're not going to get in there, you know. But it happens between seven and 10,000 times every year. Um, and I think it's just absolutely unnecessary. All puppies know how to swim from the time they're three or four weeks old. You put them over the water and they will just do this and then they will do this and they'll go faster and you put them in and they will, they will swim around and they'll do a great job. But they need to practice. They need to understand their physicality in the water, and they need to understand buoyancy. Most importantly, they need to understand how to get out of the swimming pool. Not a natural body of water. It's not a lake, not a stream, not the ocean. So dogs know how to swim, but they don't understand the concept of the swimming pool. I do meet a lot of dogs who like natural bodies of water, and they look at the pool and they're like, what is that? You know? But once they figure it out, it's all good then. Um, but you have to make sure these little guys know how to get out of a pool. That's a big message with this, is preparing them in case there's some sort of situation where they find themselves in the water. So if a dog falls in, a lot of times their instinct is to try to get out where they got in. Dogs are not great climbers, most of them. Some Jack Russell Terriers maybe, but um, in general, they can't climb out. So they will just swim around, swim around. Most dogs drown two feet away from the stairs or from the ladder, and that's not cool. So. Um, I'm trying to fight that, is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to let people know that let's be safe about this. Let's try to stop these accidents from happening. They're unnecessary. It's just about education. You know, be responsible. In addition to teaching your pets how to get out of the pool, it's also important all the classic safety precautions, including, <laughs> look at this guy on his back down here. <laughs> uh, you know, limited access to the pool, alarms, fences, all that stuff, also really, really important. I went on a mission. I basically taught 1,500 puppies how to swim, how to get out of the pool. We practiced. Traveled around the country, and uh, most of the puppies who came out just got swimming lessons, A to B. Start to condition them on what are we doing here? What is this? And you basically teach them where the exit is. Now, once they start with that kind of state of mind, they're like, oh, okay. You know, there is only one way to get out here. That's a good start, but for sure, all the humans that I met, I said, if your dog's ever gonna be around a pool, you need to apply this to that situation too. But even still, as long as the dog starts to understand I'm in a body of water and there's only one way out, that's a huge advantage for them. Otherwise, they just wouldn't know. They just swim around in a circle or stay in the same spot the whole time. They would have no clue. So zoomed around, mostly didn't even take pictures. I was mostly just a swim teacher for about four months, 
zooming around, working with all these puppies from six weeks to six months. Um, out of 1,500 puppies that I work with, there's 72 in the book and uh, 105 photos. So there's a lot of disappointed puppy parents out there who didn't get a great picture, uh, but at least the puppies are going to be safer. I also worked with uh, mostly rescue puppies for this project. I love dogs of all types. I support dogs of all types, all sorts, all backgrounds. Uh, but I'm also a big fan of rescue and adoption and always encourage people, if they can, uh, consider adoption because it's terrific. So most of these guys are going to be rescue puppies from different organizations across the country, some tiny little rescue groups and some major animal shelters. Um, and I just thought this could be a good reminder for folks that adoption is a great option for sure. This is Popsicle. This is in Chicago. Um, this is Ginger. This was maybe going to be the book cover, but we thought maybe it's a little bit too sassy. Uh, but one of my favorite shots, for any, any photography buffs out there? Anybody do photography? A couple folks. So if anybody's curious about this, so this is, uh, I'm shooting with a dive housing now by Icolite Underwater Systems. It's a Canon 5D Mark III. And this is probably the least interesting part of this, the technical stuff. It's like, I just like the dogs. Um, but you know, it's a 5D Mark III by Canon. It's a fisheye lens, 8 to 15. I'm using uh, yeah, the, the casing, the underwater housing. I'm using two DS-161 strobes, one here, one here. And the background, that's not a pool light. That's actually an off-board strobe or a slave light, if you do any studio stuff. So it's really cool. It's a little gizmo that you can't really buy anymore because it's off the market, but I have some. Uh, always got to be one step ahead with photography, I guess. But these are pretty cool. So I can drop them into the pool. It's basically a, a, a strobe like this. I attach a little funny gadget to it called an EV manual controller. It's basically an eyeball. You guys are technical people here. Um, it's a little eyeball, and it's, it's got an optic sensor in there. So what it looks for is a significant change in ambient light. When that, little, when that little sensor sees my strobes go off, it'll go ahead and fire off that strobe down there. It would be impossible to try to wire 10 strobes in that pool and also a little bit dangerous. I think the puppies are jumping in, I'm all over the place. So I basically just drop these in the pool and it, it helps to create better lighting and uh, catch lights and it's just kind of fun. So when you're flipping through the book, you might think they're pool lights, but they're actually called off-board strobes. And they're about $1,700 a piece. Sometimes I'd have 10 of them in the water and you're looking at 17,000 plus. My camera's about 14,000. So you got $31,000 in the pool and I don't even have insurance, but I need to get some. <laughs> Uh, this is Raleigh. This is in Tucson, Arizona. Quick note about this one. Uh, it was important to work with the puppies in really warm water, just like our, our human children teaching them to swim. I don't think we're going to put them in 40 degree water. It might be a little chilly. Uh, so we want to make sure the puppies are comfortable, have a really positive experience. And between 80 and 92 is kind of the sweet spot for these guys. This pool was in Tucson, Arizona last like September. And I knew it was getting kind of late, at, you know, or kind of cold at, at night, like 40 degrees. So I call the pool owner, and I'm thinking, I don't know what, what the water's going to be like. So I ask him. He's like, it's cold. Do you have a heater? Yep. You turn it on? Sure. Turns it on. I arrive the next day. It's 100 degrees <laughs> outside. And the heater's still on. I'm like, oh. And the bubble, the bubble tarp is on. So it's locking all the heat in. So we peel that back, 107. <laughs> oh, too hot. Uh, and so these little puppies, you don't want to put them in 107 degree water. They can only be in there for a couple minutes. Went to the freezer, grabbed some ice cubes, tossed them in. Didn't make a lot of a difference. <laughs> Got to try something. Uh, but the air temperature started going down, and then the puppies arrived later in the afternoon. We got the water down to about 102, and we were able to have maybe five minutes with each puppy in the water. Uh, most of them, again, just got their lessons, and that was it. But a couple of them jumped in, so kind of a fun, kind of a fun note. Uh, these are my little terrier guys, and this is also in Chicago. Had a good, really good day in Chicago for this shoot. My first Chicago shoot, we had 30 puppies. I flew in, brought all my gear. My gear didn't arrive. Who knows where it went? Just disappeared. So I called a friend of mine, shipped in the backup gear for another $400, planned this all out for weeks, went to the photo shoot, didn't get a single book picture. Um, and that happened quite a few times making this book. I mean, if you think about 1,500 puppies, there's only 72 that are in here. You know, most of them just didn't even get pictures at all. So, but then we had another shoot in Chicago in an indoor pool, and we probably had 10 pictures from that shoot. So you just never really know. But these guys are cool. We were going to make it a two-page spread, but then we thought, no, you know, people are going to think it's either two different pictures or two different, or the same dog, you know. Um, and it's actually two 
two separate dogs that are siblings. And I just think for them to jump in together like that at the same time, that's kind of a rare thing. So as we're doing our swimming lessons, I have to kind of gauge, are these puppies really starting to be playful or are they just getting their lesson? Uh, I don't want to push it too much with these puppies. You know, it's important that it's positive and that's it. Some of these puppies started playing around. I grab my camera off the side and wait for the moment where they're jumping in. Some of them are jumping in just because it's fun. Uh, or they'll jump in with me. If you look at some videos on my website, you'll see me jumping in together with the puppies. And they'll come in too with me. Some are chasing toys underwater, and some are diving as deep as five feet, uh, even at 11 weeks. This is little Ava. Uh, Ava's a beagle mix, also in Chicago. And at six weeks, just really impressive. Uh, impressive form uh, and cute little face with that little white stripe. And there's Ava all grown up. The owners of uh, Ava sent me this picture the other day, and it's kind of, there's six weeks, there's about a year in six weeks, but they grow up so fast. They grow up so fast, and I'm just so proud to see them. I, I've been traveling around the country, and I see a lot of these puppies now that are grown up, and I just give them a big hug, but it's funny to see how they've turned out. Uh, this is Corey. This is also in Tucson in an 80-degree pool. Um, just really like this, love the color of the water. Corey was terrific. And one of six cattle dog mix puppies in Tucson, all rescue puppies. Uh, you also have Zelda. This is my favorite picture in the book. It's not the most impressive. It's not even underwater. It's what you would call an over-under shot. Uh, the reason why I like this picture is this picture embodies the entire spirit and message of why I made the book. And that's because little Zelda here at about seven weeks, um, special needs puppy, needed some additional TLC. And the human caretakers for Zelda said she is not ready to go swimming yet. She's too little, you know, we're too worried about her. And I was saying, well, I think it's even more important that she starts to learn because she's around a swimming pool. You guys let her around the swimming pool every day. She's just running around here. And she's probably going to be adopted by somebody who has a swimming pool or has access to a swimming pool. They said, no, no, she's too little, you know, she's too little. Um, so she sat there and she watched her brother and her other siblings do swimming lessons for about a half hour. She just watched, just watched, just sitting there, watched. Then all of a sudden, splash, she jumped in on her own. Jumped in, I was on the other side of the pool, but she had been watching us for a half hour, and she watched where the exit was, she watched where the stairs were. She didn't swim to me, she swam to the exit. And she got out on her own, this little tiny thing. Jumped in, swam over there, and got out on her own. And I was so proud of that little puppy. That was my proudest moment of making the entire book, is this little character right here, because that's what it's all about. And her humans didn't want her to do it, and she said, I'm going to do it anyways. So, pretty cool. Here she is on her little surfboard. <laughs> uh, this is Monty. This is sort of, uh, reminds me of the movie The Ring a little bit. Uh, and this is in a, a, a dog pool in New York called Water for Dogs. People don't know it, but there is a swimming pool for dogs in New York. It's a hydrotherapy pool. So this pool is mostly working with dogs that are uh, restoring quality of life to dogs through swimming. Uh, rehabilitating from injury and also as alternative to surgery. But hydrotherapy, amazing thing for dogs, and it really does uh, improve their quality of life when they have certain situations come along and also extend their lives sometimes by many years. So if your dog's ever having some troubles, some health troubles, uh, depending on what that is, look into hydrotherapy because it can really make a huge difference uh, for your family. So they also at this pool apparently do underwater puppies photo shoots. So we did that, and this is Monty at six months. Doesn't really look like a puppy anymore, still puppy mentality, uh, but I just think this picture is fascinating. Um, I like to have different types of images in the books that I'm making, and I, I think that my whole thing with dogs is I love their range of emotion. I think it's very similar to human beings. I think that's why we connect with them in so many ways. And I think that's why we identify with the pictures too, because I think when we see a picture like this, or smiling, or doing whatever, we sort of see a little piece in of us in that picture too. Uh, but I love this shot. Chinese Crested, Harry Hairless, a lot of people argue with me, oh, only Labs and Goldens like the water, and Newfoundland sometimes. Um, and I say that's just not true. You know, I've met quite a few Labs and Golden Retrievers that just don't like to swim. Or they do get in and they're terrible swimmers because they haven't had the right experience. So it's fun to be able to profile some different types of dogs like the Chinese Crested here at 10 weeks, little scooters jumping in and having a blast. Kind of weird looking dogs, but uh, yeah, they're fun. This is Prince, also excellent form. This is in Portland, Maine. Uh, did an outdoor shoot that day in about 82 degree water. And at eight weeks, I mean, this is just a natural, this is a natural swimmer. 
These are my labs. These are my stars. This is down in uh, Fort Myers, Florida. There's three of them down there. Reason, Grits, and Jack. They're all from the same litter. They're all being groomed to be doc dogs. Anybody familiar with doc dogs? It's basically a competition for dogs. The idea is you have a huge ramp, giant pool. Which dog can jump the farthest? <laughs> and they also have the new contest, which dog can jump the highest? So you have both of those. The dogs go crazy for it. Uh, the people doing doc dogs are a little strange, I think. <laughs> they're kind of stage moms a little bit, and they're all like, but uh, it is a very positive thing, and the dogs just, they go crazy for it. So at six weeks, they started swimming. By nine weeks, they were showing up at the pool and whining to get in. And when I met them at 10 weeks, it was just a home run. They were ready to rock and roll. They hadn't really been underwater yet, um, but it was just a no-brainer. So they were just happy to, to participate. Here they are, little puppy teeth. These guys, so I wanted to try to have all three of them in the same picture. It was impossible because of the hierarchy. So how many of you guys have more than one dog at home? OK, so you could, you could tell me that somebody's going to be the boss, somebody's not. Uh, it's called alpha omega. So dogs are pack animals. Somebody's always going to be the boss. It may be very extreme, or it may be more subtle, but there's always going to be somebody who's in charge. Even with these guys, even though they're living with three separate people, they spend enough time together where they developed a hierarchy. So even if these guys, who had never met, they hang out for enough hours, they're going to figure out, it might even happen right away, who's the boss. They might take a few, a few hours or a few days or a few weeks to figure it out, and they may challenge each other for it. These guys were trying to figure it out. Little Jack, who you don't see in this picture, Jack is somewhere in the background looking for another toy. He decided, I'm not the boss. So he was just doing his own thing. He wouldn't compete with these two. These two would compete, and they were trying to figure out who's the boss. And that's why I could get this picture. Um, I don't know who the boss is now, but I'm going to see them in a couple weeks. I would be curious to see uh, you know, who's number one. But pretty unbelievable to see these little guys. If you hop on my website, you'll see some behind the scenes video of them swimming underwater in slow motion. And it's just it's spectacular to see what they're doing. Here's a behind the scenes still of me. Uh, and either, this is either reason or grits, I can't tell by the collar. But this is kind of show you, this is taken with a GoPro. Um, GoPro, this is a, a Hero Black Edition. I think this is the 3, the Model 3. And did some behind the scenes stills and videos. You know, you, you don't quite have the illumination on me or the dog that you might want to have, but it's kind of cool to see the positioning here. I'm holding my breath and going under. A lot of people think I'm wearing scuba diving gear. I said, if the dogs wear scuba diving gear, then I'll wear scuba diving gear. But if the dogs aren't, then I'm not. So we basically just go down, come back up together. Underwater dogs, I'd hold my breath up to 90 seconds to do multiple takes. Um, this book right here with puppies, I'm mostly underwater for a few seconds at a time, and that's about it. The labs may be up to 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Uh, but there's really no reason for me to have diving, diving gear. I do wear a wetsuit because of the water temperature. Even 80 degrees, anybody a scuba diver out there? Maybe, scuba divers. So if you're, we're 98.6 degrees, uh, unless you have a fever, or you're an alien, and then you're going to be, I don't know what temperature. But uh, if you're in water that's 80 degrees for a long period of time, your core temperature will drop down, and you will get hypothermia. And you don't want hypothermia, it's no fun. So um, even in 80 degrees, you can get hypothermia. I spend sometimes 14 hours in the pool in a day. And if I didn't have that wetsuit on, I'm in 80 degree water, and sometimes I'm just not moving around that much. My core temperature will drop, and I'll get hypothermia, and then it's just kind of dangerous. Um, never really a life-threatening thing for me, but it is something you got to look out for. So that's why I wear the wetsuit. And then I also wear the wetsuit because the dogs, they have their claws. They're trying to give me a hug. They're really close to me, sometimes inches away from the camera. And so uh, over time, you know, you get pretty scratched up, pretty dinged up. So I wear the wetsuit for that, too. Here's about the same moment, maybe taking a couple seconds after this. So here's this. The tennis ball dropped out of the frame. In the book, you'll see some tennis balls. And also, you'll see no tennis balls in other pictures. It just kind of depends. Sometimes the puppies were just jumping in because they thought it was fun. Sometimes they're chasing a toy like they're doing right here. Um, I try to sink the tennis ball so that it's not always in the picture. I just don't like having a tennis ball always in there. It's, I think it gets kind of, it's fun, but it gets also a little bit old, too. But you can kind of see the illumination, the puppy teeth. That's not a dog or a cat. Uh, that's baby Kiera. So this is my most recent project, which will be published in April. I'm not a baby guy. I'm a dog guy, and then cats, and then like 100 other creatures. 
and then maybe babies. <laughs> no offense to any parents out there of human children. Uh, but through the course of working with the puppies, you know, I was just shocked at the stats on you know, the, the water safety for pets. Same applies for human babies. Drowning is the number one cause of accidental death in children under five in the United States. Between 500 and 700 children under the age of five drown, mostly in swimming pools every year. And there's no reason for that. You know, mostly it's because people just haven't taken the precautions. They don't understand the dangers of a swimming pool. And the babies are not prepared for any type of situation that involves the water at all. These guys are all going through swimming lessons, infant swimming lessons, safety and survival all around the country. Uh, I tagged along at first just to explore the idea to see if I could do something with it. I shot a story for New York Times Magazine called Little Nemos. That was fun. Uh, and then we decided let's make a book about it. Don't know if the book will sell, don't really care. Uh, but if we can get the message out there, some of the media outlets we've been working with for water safety for pets, they're also on board with this. So we can at least get the message out there about the dangers of swimming pools and preparing our human children also for potential situations like this. Uh, but these guys are fun. I had a lot of fun with these babies. Photographed 750 between four months and 13 months all around the country. Emphasis on California, Arizona, Texas, and Florida with the most swimming pools. And just had a really good time, but at the end of the day, I wasn't trying to bring any of them home with me. Nope. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll be a dad. I really have no idea. Um, but I'm really proud of this project. It'll be published in a few months. And I hope that it makes a difference at least a little bit uh, for the situation right now with children. And then we have not a lot going on here. Who can tell me what that is? Yeah, somebody said a dog yesterday. I'm like, it's the longest. <laughs> It's the longest dog nails I've ever seen. So I have done some work with some exotic animals underwater. Um, this little clown right here. Anybody can who can tell me what that is? Wait, somebody said otter. <laughs> somebody says seal. Anybody else? Sea lion. There it is. Otter. Who said that's an otter? <laughs> that's way off. <laughs> it's way off. Uh, that's a California sea lion named Kai. And real quick, I am working on a book called Underwater Creatures. Whether it becomes a book, I don't know. I might have to self-publish it. It's expensive to make it. My publisher may or may not actually want to do it. Um, but it would be to create some really interesting and joyful images of different types of animals underwater, some of which we're not used to seeing, like orangutans, parrots, foxes, all kinds of stuff you wouldn't normally see underwater. Would love to make the book. I think we can also bring awareness about uh, all the other species of animals. I mean, hey, we gotta be responsible for dogs and cats um, and human children, but what about all the other animals too? I love animals. Would love to try to make a difference for some of these different species. A lot of important issues around each species. And would love to make the book. It's a tough challenge though, working with wild animals, either in captivity or in the wild, is a, is a very passionate topic. And without getting into it too much, as a photographer working with an animal in the wild, some people are going to be upset about that. If you work with them in captivity, some people are going to be upset about too. I work with bears in Alaska for the New York Times. They sent me in uh, to Cooper Landing, Alaska, to document the migration and spawning of sockeye salmon. Really cool assignment. Jumped in the 37 degree river, so excited. Didn't bring my dry suit. That would have been a good idea. But uh, did document the salmon. Along came some bears. They strolled through, did some pictures. Ended up being reasonably close to the bears, not by choice, it just happened. Uh, they wanted the fish, I was near the fish. So some people got upset with me for that because I was just there and the bears came along. I mean, it happens every day in Alaska. I mean, it's like we're on their territory and it just kind of happened. So, and it's for the New York Times, it's a, it's a great piece about sockeye salmon, about the conditions that they're facing right now and all the issues, but people were upset about that. I got some death threats for that. Um, Oh yeah, and that's not everybody, but it's, it's, it is a hot topic. It's enough where like, it bothers me. And I'm like, you know what, what, did I do something wrong? Alternatively, this sea lion was actually injured by humans to the point where it could not live in the wild on its own. So it lives in a sanctuary in California. It has the best quality of life it possibly can. Uh, his name is Kai, and now he's sort of an ambassador for sea lions, which is terrific. I did a photo shoot for Kai to raise awareness about this uh, sea lion situation in California with stranded sea lion pups, really, really big deal to raise money. I thought it's a home run idea. Posted some shots, people wanted to kill me. Death threats. And I'm like, don't kill me, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do something good here. So it's a very tough thing. You know, I'd like to be able to make the book, 
feature 70 or 80 different types of animals. Um, but as you can tell, I, well, I'd like to live. Um, <laughs> life is pretty good. So I don't know. We'll see. But you know, dom you know, domestic dogs, domestic cats, people aren't. It's like I can take pictures of them, and it's OK. But when you start photographing other types of animals in any situation, people start to ask the question, should you be doing that? Um, so I don't know. But I do look forward to making that book if I can. Um, I would be very excited to make it. I think it would be fantastic. I think it would be um, a book that will make a difference for a lot of animals out there, too. Anybody have any questions? I'll ask a quick question. Um, are you looking to do more things than just books? Like, I see this as being like a TV show or something, and you're, like going to people's houses and filming them, you know, the people and their dogs. And, you know, it's always it ends up being about the people and their stories rather than the dogs. But I can totally see it. You'd be brilliant for it. Like a, the entertainment show, and then like one celebrity per episode or something. You know, I um, over the last couple of years, there's been some possibilities. I appeared on a couple of TV shows, like reality TV shows, some of which were, some of which were good, some of which were questionable. Uh, I appeared on a show called Duck Dynasty, and you know, I didn't know what it was at the time. I went on the show, and it turned out to be this big show. And you know, you, overall, it was positive, but I don't know. <laughs> Weird people, and uh, I've kind of I've kind of had to like move away from from Duck Dynasty for a while because of all the controversy and, and everything. I just stay out of it. But um, I don't know. Maybe one day I'd do a TV show. I'd probably rather not do it. I like my privacy. Um, people know about my pictures. Something like a billion people saw underwater puppies images in the last three weeks. A billion people, one sixth of the world population, looking at my images. That's crazy. I can walk down the street. Nobody knows me. I can go shopping. I can do whatever. No one. I don't get bothered. I don't have people showing up at my house. Um, and I guess if you had a TV show, I don't know what it's like to be a famous person, an actor or a singer or something, but I got, it's got to be a hassle, I think. So I think my life is pretty fun right now, and I get to just do my thing. My images can be popular. I can just be the guy on the sidelines or behind the scenes. But um, there are some other plans, potentially, for underwater dogs uh, in the future. And you know, I think that I'll make as many books as I can, but there's some other things that we're working on that may come to fruition, so, yeah. Anybody else? All righty. Well, I will be signing some books if you'd like me to sign your book. It's an extra $100, <laughs> <laughs> except in cash only. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but happy to answer any more questions or sign your book. Thanks for coming, and thanks for loving dogs as much as they love us. <laughs>